right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the first middle grades conversation of the 2022-2023 uh, school year. Believe it or not, this is our eighth season of gathering once a month and talking about uh, all things middle level. And this year is uh, particularly interesting because we're coming off of three heavy years of teaching through a pandemic. So uh, we're going to hear what it's been like in our classrooms and how people have adjusted and the behaviors they're seeing. We're going to cover a wide range of topics across the year. Uh, this work is sponsored by the Middle Grades Collaborative and the Tarrant Institute for Innovative Education. My name is Don Taylor. I teach sustainability at Main Street Middle School in Montpelier. And I'm going to ask our uh, conversation partic participants to introduce themselves. And again, welcome everybody. We hope uh, middle level folks out there are thriving and we can't wait to hear uh, how the year is going. Meg? Thank you, Don. Uh, my name is Meg O'Donnell. I teach seventh and eighth grade humanities at Shelburne Community School on one of two seven eight teams. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Hi, I'm Joe Rivers. I teach social studies at Brattleboro Area Middle School. I'm on a team of four core teachers. We have um, let's see, academic support and special education and seven advisory teachers, all part of the, the package, and we work with 75 young people. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Peely Hunt. I'm a 5A generalist in Williston Central School on Swift House. So one of the things that I'm noticing, and we'll probably touch on this throughout the year, is just as we're talking, each of us has uh, we work with middle level students, but we each have a different team configuration. So there's uh, some different organizational structures in place. And uh, for those folks who are out there, you know, your, your structure may look similar, it may look different, but it's going to be interesting to, ha to hear how each of us is working uh, through those structures and how they're um, supporting middle level students and families using those organizational, uh, those organizational pieces. Our first question uh, is really, kind of the one probably everybody's expecting is how has the start of your year been? Uh, kind of what's been your focus and what have you been working on these first five or six weeks of school to get your uh, team off on the right start? And we'll uh, go to Meg to start us off. All right. Yeah, um, it has actually been a really lovely uh, start to the year and um, I'm not going to lie, like I feel a little cautious about saying that because I just don't, I don't want to jinx it. Um, but it's really been um, it's been a really nice start to the year. We uh, I te as I said, I teach on a seven, eight team. So there's four teachers plus two special educators and a team para. And um, I think that um, the focus has really been just getting to, you know, obviously just getting to know our seventh graders are, we have a small numbers this year. Our class is actually, um, you, last year was like 84. This year it's about 76, 77. And just those extra five or six kids when you disperse it among um, four core teams and um, Wendy and I teach humanities multi-age. Uh, the numbers are small and I don't, so I don't know if that's contributing to the culture or the climate. Um, I think as teachers, we feel uh, eager, you know, there's like an eagerness. We are experiencing brand new, um, some brand new folks on our team in terms of special ed and a para and also in our building, our 5-8 um, uh, principal is brand new. His name is Brett Clough and we have a brand new special ed uh, director of special ed. So we've got some lots of new folks. Um, and I think that that has somewhat contributed to just this kind of sense of a fresh start. Um, something I'm noticing, I was just talking to Don about this, um, uh, was just getting a sense of our seventh graders coming into seventh grade with, with some student skills that we didn't see last year in the seventh graders coming in. Even just a simple thing like, hey, turn and you know, turn and talk. And they they can do that pretty readily and then they can come back. So there's not the um, uh, some of the things that we were really needing to spend time on last year in terms of 
uh, conversations have just, we haven't had to put our energy there. So that's freed us up. Um, and we've had some autonomy in our schedule. We have a waterfall schedule and we have hour blocks where last year we had these 45 minute blocks. So I think that transition, the reducing the number of transitions has helped for kids to anchor them a little bit more. We get, we get to get through more stuff. Uh, and I'll just say one last thing. Um, and that is that our school made a commitment to really establish a middle school identity for many years. We literally stepped into a new team structure um, in the 1919, 2019, 2019, 2020 school year. That was a long time ago. I do feel like I've been teaching for a hundred years, but um, uh, they, uh, we are dedicating some time to a community connect. So one hour a week, we are doing something in our, um, right now it's just in our teams, but the goal is to really build a sense of a 5A community. And uh, that's been really exciting. Um, you know, it's, it's clunky, but we're working on it and uh, I'm excited about it. So thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. There's some key words that uh, I'd like to come back to in, in what you had to say, and I appreciate that. Uh, Joe? Hi, I have to give you a heads up. I'm not really done today. This is my planning period every other day. And so a bunch of young people are gonna come in the room in about five minutes. So I'll be muting around then and managing a bit as they're plugging in their Chromebooks. So uh, we've uh, changes or, or differences. The last few years, frankly, I've felt like I was swimming underwater. It's something I can do. Uh, I don't do it all that well. It's really hard. There's a lot more energy that's expended. And when I poke my head up to catch my breath, you know, I was going back underwater again to do something hard. And that's how it felt these last few years, uh, trying to work with young people with all the different structures that were being built in, around the COVID situation. We have less of that now. And so it's feeling, it's freeing. <laughs> Really, we're starting with a, a new group of 75 young people, seventh graders. And so we're focused on routines, really establishing routines. They're in a new building. They're seeing a new set of faces. We run a pretty traditional, crazy middle level schedule with you know seven periods a day. And one day is one set of seven classes and the other day is another set. So. Here comes the end of our day. Uh, I'll pass. <laughs> pass it on. Kevin? Thanks. Um, yeah, start of the school year has gone really well so far. It's, it's now run smooth, and we have a great crop of new fifth graders and a couple other new students who joined us this year. It's been really nice to welcome them to the team. Uh, a couple of things have really stood out just in terms of you know, the start of the year that we've missed is some of our traditions that really help us establish our culture. And, and we were noticing, especially last year, um, that our cult it took a lot of work throughout the whole year to kind of keep our finger on the pulse of what we want our culture to be and keep reminding kids of it. And I think it's because, we, you know, we missed two years of some of the big team building pieces that are foundational to our team and what we're about. Um, and that was really transparent just in terms of what, how it impacted our, our team as a whole and, 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 and affected us. So it's been really nice to get back to some of those um, team building pieces. And one of the biggest ones that we do is, is a, you know, a team wide camp out at Grand Isle where we take our whole team up there overnight and, you know, have moments of just free time with them, have structured team activities, and then have just a really nice reflective moment at um, around a fire with the families and the students there. And it's like, like at that moment, everybody kind of feels like they're all involved and included in the team. And um, I don't know, it's a, I always feel like it's a really powerful time for us to feel like we're connected as one whole versus, you know, a bunch of individuals. Uh, and it's been little things like that that have had a really positive ripple effect um, for the start of the school year for us. So I've been grateful for that, uh, just in terms of like our culture. We're still working out some kinks that have come up in the past few years. But, you know, to Meg, your point, you're saying, like some of those routines and general things that took, I felt like it took so much energy last year to be like, this is how we, we interact with each other in the class and the space and, and 
I feel like we're doing so much less of that this year now. And it, you can tell like these kids miss so much time of just socializing and being around other people to get that regular feedback from other, other just, you know, human beings and not technology. Like it, it impacted their ability to interact. And, and it's, it's been really clear in a positive way too, just like you were saying, Meg, like, yeah, we can ask pretty general, what we considered simple things and we're not getting really unexpected responses from them, but it's still happening, but more back to what it, we're, we're used to versus it being like every day is a, a battle with some stuff that shouldn't be a battle. Um, and then, yeah, just, just uh, scheduling wise, we, we are in love with our schedule this year. Last year, we were really disjointed in terms of having you know, being, we're the only 5'8 team in Williston Central. So, you know, when our students go off house for their, their specials, whether it be PE or art or world language, last year we were very disjointed where we'd have some of our fifth and sixth graders back while our seventh and eighth graders were off house and vice versa. So it really impacted like the flow of the day for us. And just like, like having those weird moments where we'd have partial classes, but not full classes. So we couldn't really commit. It was, it, it just made it really tricky um, from a scheduling standpoint. And this year our schedule was really just, uh, cohesive and awesome and, and it's been working really well for us so uh, I think that's made a big big difference um, across across the board as well that's all I got all right um, thank you very much uh, so a couple of things that I wrote down just kind of taking notes and uh, one of the things that we're I hope that we're gonna uh, touch base on throughout the course of the year is how uh, new teachers might uh, hear what we're saying and how what we're talking about might support new teachers. Um, I've heard uh, and I've talked to some new teachers uh, both last year and this year and thinking about what would you be you know, su supporting new teachers with. And some of the things that you folks just mentioned I think are really important. So number one is this idea of routines. Um, and I would say, uh, I think most of you know that I've transitioned into a sustainability position last year, and that's involved a ton of project-based learning. And one of the things that's different is that this year we're on quarters. So I see every kid in the school, but I see him for nine weeks at a time. And um, so that's been different for me. But one of the things that's been amazing this year has been the fact that I do know all of those, all of those students. And so I'm so far ahead from last year when I was meeting new students every trimester, every quarter. This year, I don't have to, I don't have to worry about that. Before I do any more speaking, I just want to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Katie Farber, who is a uh, outstanding educator uh, in a new position, I think. I'll let her uh, introduce herself. And then Katie, I'll just catch you up on kind of where we are. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. So excited to see your faces. This is great. Um, I'm a new assistant professor at St. Michael's, and I can't quite believe it. Um, but yes, it is, it is true. I just came from an elementary math methods class. Um, yeah, which is just, it's just endlessly interesting, right? Um, so I'm teaching um, ma elementary math um, and science methods and um, education in the 21st century to um, just represent the, the field of education to folks that are new to college. It's just so, so exciting. Um, so thanks. Good to see you all. Well, welcome, Katie. And we've just kind of been going around talking about how the start to our, our year has been. And Several of the folks uh, have mentioned this, the importance of routines. And I was just uh, talking about how this year I'm so far ahead because I know last year I didn't really know the sixth graders or a lot of the seventh graders even. And so um, having a little bit of a relationship with three quarters of the students now instead of a small fraction of them has really helped uh, this year. But I also just want to go back to this idea of routines and expectations. And because I'm on a, a quarter with students, one of the things I'm really focused on is how do I get the expectations very clearly in a very short amount of time so that we can jump into that project-based learning? And, and how do you do that? And how do you build culture, not only over the course of the nine or 10 weeks that I have the kids, but over the course of the four years? 
So because I'll see the kids as fifth graders, sixth graders, seventh and eighth graders, what do I, how should I be establishing routines in the fifth grade that by the eighth grade, um, they'll know those routines, they'll be able to fall right into place and we can start jumping into really exciting opportunities around leadership and around uh, community-based learning, which is kind of what we're developing this year. And the other piece that I really think is important, and Katie, we were uh, asking a question, you know, what would you say to first or second year teachers, right? Coming out of a pandemic and kind of in this, a new, we're in a new place. And Meg mentioned this idea of student skills. Like what are the student skills that we need to be focusing on right away that'll get a kid up and running and, and feeling good about sort of what's happening in the classroom. And uh, Meg mentioned this idea of turning and talking and that I made a connection with that. Uh, one of the things that's happened this year is we've been able to have, if a kid gets something with technology, hey, if you understand how to do that Google site, why don't you go over and help somebody who, uh, who might uh, have some challenges or might still have questions and using those kids to support your work in the classroom, I think has been a really big and important difference than, than in the last couple of years. So thanks everybody for, for talking about that. I guess the next, the follow-up question, and we touched on this a little bit, is how are folks intentionally working on relationships? Um, we know that those are so important. We know that that's been one of the challenges either in a remote or a hybrid environment over the last couple of years. And so what are folks doing in their classrooms or in the course of your day to be building these relationships that we know are so important to middle level students? And uh, we'll go back to Meg on that one. Thank you, Don. Um, I think, uh, I feel like I, the word that I wanna keep saying is this like relentless intention, you know, like um, really, knowing that I want to make sure that every day my kids feel seen and heard through greeting. Um, sometimes because I have the flexibility of how I'm having an hour long class now, um, that gives me some time to play with them a little bit for like 15 minutes or to stop in the middle of a, of whatever we're doing and, and, um, and play with them. And so, you know, I have these like conversation cubes that I'll put up um, like under the Elmo or we'll toss this conversation ball or something like that. I used to be able to open this door that went right outside, but um, I got in trouble for that. So I can't, I can't do that anymore. Um, we have a, a standing like daily walk with our kids right first thing in the morning. Um, and we, you know, the kids sometimes, uh, gripe about it but they really do love it and um, even if it's raining out which it's been a little soggy the last couple of days um, so that gives them an opportunity to just get some energy out and they can talk to whoever I I love that because I get to connect with some kids that I might not have in my prime group and just uh, get to know them a little bit more um, and like I mentioned the um, you know it's 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 a balance, right? It's a balance of like having fun and then being really clear about your expectations and just trying not to be wishy-washy. I know sometimes like, um, I, I would say that's a, that's like something even at 29 years of being in the classroom, like I want to just be really like clear about the expectations. So it might come off as firm, but it's also because I want to make sure that they understand that there's, you know, there's some expectations that we hold for one another um, and certainly emphasizing kindness, right? Like, like that's the bottom line for it. So, so, uh, so th those are some things that, um, that we're, that we're starting our year with and, um, and it feels like it's working. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. Well, let's see. Uh, advisory is really a very important part, and it's in in at Brattleboro area middle school. It's getting better and better. Uh, our advisory program it, it's uh, based on developmental designs in some ways, and some of us have been around before developmental designs, and 
you know, incorporate those things. And for those who are newer, it's a good uh, template framework. And uh, we have a, uh, a coach this year who is actually helping us with uh, moving it forward as a whole building, as a site. And so uh, it is giving some routine and practice for all of our students, not just those on particular teams or with a particular advisor. So that's been uh, a very positive change for the climate of our school. And uh, what Don said before about project-based stuff, project-based stuff automatically gives you the opportunity to form relationships and have conversations and work on things together and individualize. And um, that's what I try to do uh, in the classroom. And so we're fully engaged in that sort of stuff right now. And uh, we're three weeks in and so we're there. And so students are working individually uh, with projects and I'm able to have conversations with them. We're about the same size as Meg's group, I think, about 75 students. And uh, we split them up four ways and we see them for 45 minutes a day. And so I'm able to check in with everybody every day and uh, move them forward and support them. And that's really what it's about for me. Uh, a mindset really is I need to meet them where they are and then I need to try to move them forward from where they are and uh, so it's reading, writing, it's speaking, listening, it's being able to present, organize information, and make connections with things beyond themselves. And so those are the conversations that we, I try to foster. And uh, again, because of routines, some of that can happen pretty quickly. Uh, that's the expectation when folks come in and they see that. And so uh, I guess asking about uh, folks starting teaching, um, there's, there's the, these three things. There's things you believe you control, things you can influence, and then things you don't have any say in. And uh, it's a struggle to figure out where to put your energy and your time. Uh, a suggestion is to put the vast majority of your time in those things you believe you can control because you really don't even control that. But if you believe you do, uh, most days you will, and you know, setting routines and those sorts of things really help uh, give uh, patterns for the young people. And people need patterns, you know, at, at every age, and uh, expectations clear, clear as possible. Uh, and so, I guess what I've done is try to set aside, not put as much time into those things I think I can influence. Uh, if I put a lot of energy into things I think I can influence, it takes away from the stuff I really feel like I should be controlling. And uh, that's been the trade for me this year. And I've, I have less stress uh, so far, thoroughly. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin? Um, yeah, a few things that come to mind for us that we do on team, you know, our, our initial, our first kind of touch points with kids and families, are our hopes and dreams conferences that we have before the school year starts. I feel like that for us establishes that immediate relationship with the families and helps, you know, want us get to know them and the students that allows them to get to know us. Um, and it establishes that whole piece of this is what our team's all about. And this is, you know, we, we care about you an awful lot, like coming to the building and, and let's, let's get to know each other. So that, you know, knowing we always have that with all of our new fifth graders or new incoming students, whether or not they're in fifth grade, um, we've established that from, from day one. So then, you know, that has a trickle effect as they're, we have them for the four years, which is incredible. Um, so that really helps. And then, you know, when, when you say like building relationships with the year, you know, I always come back to those soft times. So you know, for us, we call it core time, which other teams like all study hall, um, snack time, like, and it's any opportunity I have to play with kids, like go throw a ball with them, eat snack with them, sit on the tables with them, say some jokes, like ask them about what they're watching at home or what their favorite things to do are like that. Just it like connects us so much. And, it, you know, I was smiling the other day. I was, I was actually hanging out with a couple of kids in here for snack. I saw one of my coworkers out throwing a Fritz with, with the other students. I'm like, like they see us as, 
you know, we're not just the teachers, but we're humans. You know, we have these other interests too, and we, we like having fun. And, and I think it brings everybody to that common ground of we're all just here to, you know, enjoy each other's company really. And, and it's a, there's more to this than just, you know, learning and sitting in a classroom for sure. And, you know, I think about those soft times too, and having kids see us be vulnerable and, and seeing us as human beings, you know, it, it does bring me back to some of those traditions we have, like, like I said earlier with the camp out and, you know, we're going to do those things like the second week of school. Again, it's, that's all it is. It's just time to hang out with kids and have those moments of, you know, it's not like an academic expectation, but it's just like, we're, we're hanging out, we're getting to know you. And, and I was laughing this year and Don, I know I had your daughter in my group, but they were ragging on me a little bit because they needed help getting their tent set up. And I wasn't done with mine yet. They're like, you're not done with that yet. Like what is taking you so long? And that's like, just like that ability to kind of joke with each other and, and, and rag on each other a little bit. I'm like, this is what it's all about. And then, you know, we had the fifth graders in the group like, oh, like, you're not in trouble for saying that to your teacher. And they see like, that's our culture. Like we can have fun. And it's also like, there's that level of respect that comes with it. Um, and then of course, yeah, like to Joe's point, advisory is always really helpful and building that immediate classroom culture. And, and with us, like our core students, we have that fifth or eighth, eighth grade group. Um, and that really helps to have that on a daily basis. And, you know, when we start any of our classes, you know, we do a really soft rollout in terms of, you know, we don't just dive into all of our academic classes. The, you know, we do so much team building the first couple of weeks. And then the first thing we roll out is our math class just because it's by grade level. But even that, like the first two weeks or so of that class, we just work on growth mindset work. And even as our other classes come out, it's like that first few classes, it's not just like, all right, we're diving into the textbook or, well, we don't use the textbooks, but we're not diving into the program, whatever we're using. But it's like, let's, let's figure out who we are as a class and, and work out like those identities and just, again, enjoy the space together and just learn, like have fun in the learning process first before we try to get into that gritty stuff. Um, and that, that always pays, you know, people are like, aren't you stressed? You're going to fall behind. I'm like fall behind for what? Like <laughs> these kids aren't getting college transcripts in middle school. Like I'm okay with, you know, having them feel like they're more comfortable in class and, you know, being two weeks behind in a curriculum. So that, that always comes up. And then uh, yeah, I love Joe's point too, that in terms of advice for new teachers, those things you believe you can control. And for me, I always come back to, you know, your ability to say yes to things. When kids ask, hey, you want to hang out, want to play, want to throw, have a catch? Like, yeah, you can control your ability to say yes and be curious about what kids are doing um, and always have a positive regard for, for other beings <laughs> in the world. Like those are things I feel like we always have control over. Um, and I would hold on to those pieces as much as possible. Thanks. Uh, Katie, do you have thoughts on this? Well, I feel like I'm, a, like I'm spiraling on what everybody's saying here, but I just, the, I can just echo some of the themes I'm hearing, you know, seeing our students from an appreciative lens as whole humans and showing them our vulnerabilities and that we are whole humans as well, right? So what music are you listening to? What, um, what do you spend your time doing? I love how you can think about a student um, being an expert in, they're all experts in something. So what are they, what are we surfacing right away that is something they can do before we're starting to consider what deficit or, or piece of learning loss you might want to um, address, right? So so, so I, I love all of that and the, the playfulness, the de-stressing. Um, I feel like what one thing that we did is we would put the word uh, B on a bulletin board and have them brainstorm all the ways like a like a, a sunshine or a flower coming from that. So, so we want to be courageous. We want to be um, accepting. We want to be creative. And then that's like an anchor chart for the norms and for how we care for each other. Um, and instead of sort of like rules, it's how we want to be. Um, but I think as far as teaching goes, you know, helping kids see how they're alike, um, helping them just not get stuck in a certain friend group, but like you know, rotating seats and sticks and connections and experiences, um, like we've been talking about, shared experiences. Um, also showing the vulnerability of the teacher is really important. So the power differential is not so great. And so a lot of students aren't, aren't, aren't just scared. Um, those are the things I'm thinking about. Um, advice for first year teachers, boy, lots of thoughts there. Um, but one would be, um, you'll never finish the to-do list on each day. So it's kind of about prioritizing what 
what will also like tend to your values and why you became a teacher, but then also make your tomorrow self um, able to exist. <laughs> so prioritize the things that you need to do for the next day, let the rest go and, and have another shot at it tomorrow. Um, I used to think I had to clear the list every day and I would come home very, very late um, and it wasn't super healthy. So those are some thoughts for you. So wait a minute, I don't have to finish the list. Uh, that's that's a new learning for me. <laughs> I'm making one as you folks are talking. Um, there's so many things that people have said that I feel like are are so important, and uh, I want to just kind of I want to this idea of vulnerability. So I'm teaching, like I said, I'm teaching a new program, and last year we did this. Uh, we partnered with King Arthur Flower in this bake for good. So if you didn't know this, I um, in COVID we lost our FCS program due to personnel and and you know, because people couldn't work together. And so I'm in my third classroom now in four years, which is the FCS room. And uh, the first trimester last year, I was definitely afraid of letting eighth graders into the kitchens. Uh, I was just like, oh my gosh, that's going to be. And after finally, you know, after the feedback uh, from the kids, now we're in the kitchen as much as possible. And uh, so we partnered with Bake for Good and we're baking bread we're making food together and then we're donating that to the community to this organization just basics and what's so amazing about it is if you just say to kids look we need to be safe we need to be respectful and responsible and if you can't do that we're not going to do we're not we can't go in the kitchen because i need to trust you there's 22 of you and the kids just eat that stuff up and to see these kids kind of working together and then collaborating uh, on something and and you know the first so the first round King Arthur says learn bake and share so the first round we make and then we eat it you know and then the kids can take it home to their family and it's just so interesting you know when you go back to something as basic as food and Maslow's hierarchy and when you're getting kids working together to do this and then to share it with your family and and the kids come back and say oh yeah we had it for dinner or I toasted it and I had it for breakfast it just, it's kind of building those relationships. And then the other piece to it is after the pandemic, um, I didn't invent this phrase, but feeling good by doing good. So we're able to take those kids over and to do the donation so they get to see where it's going and kind of close that circle. And again, just having kids out in the community and talking to other folks, other adults, I think has been really important. And that idea of working for the community and with the community I think is um, that allows me in the classroom to start focusing on things like transferable skills, like Joe talked about speaking and listening and communicating and just, you know, how to move through a crowd when you're in a public space. Just those sort of skills, um, I think, are, are really important. And, and doing that sort of outside of the classroom in conjunction with our projects, I think it's been really important. I also, uh, I'm re-emphasizing the PLPs this year uh, because I see the kids for four years and I only see them for a brief time. Let's put all the evidence of what we're doing on the PLP. And then the next year we can go back and add the evidence so that over the course of four years, they're gonna have, you know, from fifth to eighth grade, imagine the evidence that they're gonna have demonstrating their growth and learning. So that's been something that I've been working on. And then this other piece is, uh, thinking about reflection. And so when kids are in the kitchen and working with each other, what, what went well? What were, what were some challenges and how could we do it better next time? Uh, I think is, is also uh, really important and building this kind of structured reflection leads to self-assessment. So that's another piece too, is when, you know, when we're, you know, how do you uh, assess a kid who's being a great leader who's saying, hey, I can do that or I can help out with this. Instead, you know, we give them the language of the transferable skills. We talk about leadership. We talk about, as Katie mentioned, how we want to be. And then you have the kids doing the self-assessment and they're, I mean, they're their best evaluator, right? And so I think that that is something that's really important and something that we want to build on. And it's also this idea of inclusion. Uh, when we have kids thinking about working as a team and getting things done, and then the other piece that is kind of, well, there's a couple more, but one thing is that, you know, when you're in the kitchen, you make mistakes, right? Like we had one group put double the amount of vegetable oil in this one recipe. 
the muffins didn't come out so great, right? So you're looking at it with, geez, what, you know, what, what went on here? And uh, it's, you know, it's not a big deal. And I think it shows the kids that it's okay to make mistakes. And, um, and, you know, you just have to kind of work through it and figure out it's problem solving, figure out what went wrong and how can we do better next time? So those have been uh, really important. And then I'd say one challenge for me is advisory. So we've moved back to an everyday advisory and I want to make it really good. I have kids who I don't see like all, all day long. And so that's been somewhat of a, a little bit of a challenge. So I'm, I'm working on that. I want to make it really good. I want to make it fun. I want kids to feel like they belong. Uh, but that's something that I'm working on and thinking about, uh, you know, on a daily basis. How can we have fun and in an informal way, but also the restorative practices so that when we need to have a, a serious conversation, we have the foundation in place to do that. Um, so that's just something I'm thinking about and working on. So uh, it's almost four o'clock. I just have, I have two more questions. Um, and one of the questions, I guess, is a little bit of a challenging one. Um, we had a conversation in our eighth grade class and we were talking about discrimination and we were talking about issues of race. And you know, the question is how do we create a sustainable community? Because if you, you, if you don't feel like you belong or if you're getting treated differently or discriminated against or worse experiencing, well, not worse, but um, experiencing racism or, or things like that, how can you be expected to, to be a part of the community and the team and to work at the bigger issues that all of us face. Um, and so we had a pretty hard conversation about that. And the kids were very open and honest that this stuff is still happening. It's happening on a regular basis. And I'm just wondering how people are thinking about, you know, equity issues and anti-racist uh, issues and how that's showing up in your, you know, your daily work. Uh, knowing that uh, we have kids uh, who um, who are experiencing that in our classrooms and families as well. And I know that's, a, I mean, it's a tough question, but it's one I want to bring up as we're talking about relationships and as we're talking about the beginning of the year. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Meg. Thank you, Don. Um, yeah, uh, I think, um, I'm not sure if, if I'm going to be able to answer like all of it, but what I just took a here and I'm, I'm saying this in part too, for our new teachers about always being willing to learn. Like we have to also be willing, like we're going to make mistakes. We're going to screw it up and then being willing to learn from that. And last night I took a um, learning for justice uh, one night workshop. It was on teaching authentic uh, authentic teaching of honest history or something like that. It was fabulous. And what I loved about it is that I literally had, I, la I like walked away with something that I can put into practice like the next day. And so what I, I say that because it reminded me of helping students to be critical thinkers and some exercises around being critical, critically analyzing text. And there were like four key questions, like whose voice is represented, whose who's isn't represented? Um, who is the audience of this text? Um, what was it intended for? And um, where where might there be bias or, or, or um, inherent bias in that? And what I appreciated about that was that, and it's right on Learning for Justice website, if you if you um, log in and or create an account, it's all free. All their resources are free. Um, even if you're not a humanities teacher, I just loved the um, uh, I loved the the practice. Um, I started in my humanities class this idea of spheres of um, spheres of impact, and so we talked to kids because um, last year I did this whole thing on identity, and because we're in a two year rotation. I needed something a little bit different to get at identity. And so we did this, um, the spheres of impact, like who's in, who there's you in the center and then your family and friends, and then your, um, uh, your small communities, like your soccer team or your team and then the world. And we talked about like, 
how do those influence um, how do those influence you? And then we flipped it a little bit and talked about um, how do you then um, what are your um, what are your responsibilities? Um, let me just like what are your duties or obligations or responsibilities to those people in your spheres of impact? And it really brought up a lot of conversations for, with kids about um, you know like if you, what's your duty to yourself first? And then um, if you can recognize that, you know, you need to show respect to yourself, then that thread of respect goes all the way through to your friends and your family and your small communities and the world at large. And it just got us thinking about this idea of obligation in a positive way. Like we have, we have influence and we um, can use it for good or we can use it um, uh, you know, for, to perpetuate negativity and how, so I'm hope I'm looking to lean on that structure a little bit when we look at migrant farm workers, or when we look at some other texts that we'll, um, be looking at this year. So, uh, anyway, continue to learn and like, uh, think about our influence. Joe? Thinking I'm next, yes. So, well, uh, I tend to look through the lens of local history and then uh, use those stories and apply them to what's going on now to make connections and uh, ask the young people to try to start looking at things beyond themselves in relation to whatever the issues are. And it's a it's a tool that feels comfortable for me in that uh, it starts, uh, it's rooted in what has happened and how it's been interpreted. And much of our time is spent on uh, reinterpreting or interpreting what was written and understanding how it, uh, the story isn't really uh, accurate <laughs> and then making uh, the research efforts to try to rectify that. We have had a relationship with the local historical society for the last decade or so, and we do work with them on, on these sorts of things. Uh, I, I try to have the students not dwell so much on how they feel about where they're coming from, <laughs> but more about how where they're coming from is interpreted by others and then how the stories can be told differently if they're shared and understood differently. So an example is people who grew up in this town went to school and were told that the first person born in Brattleboro was born in 1734 in a building about a mile south of here. And it's on his gravestone and every, every parent and grandparent knows that story who lives in this community. And we tell a different story. There were already people here before 1734. And uh, so that's, I, I guess that's how, I, how we go after it. Uh, and the other thing I like what Meg said, um, I also am taking a course that, you know, even though I'm older, <laughs> taking courses and saying, I have to relearn you know, I, I have to first, the stuff that I learned that wasn't appropriate, I need to be able to set aside. And then I need to relearn uh, you know, a way to work with young people to carry them forward. And so it's not just young teachers that need to be uh, participating in professional development. It's all of us all the time. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, right from what you just said, Joe, I think that you need to be committed to being a lifelong learner more than anything um, when doing this work. Uh, you know, for me, what I think of is, you know, when, when we're talking with our students about about these topics and and, um, and when they just come up organically, it's, just, it's like letting them know that we're also like on this journey of like 
learning more and and I think being vulnerable in front of your students is really important. Um, you know, whenever I start any of these conversations, like it's, I always like to start by just addressing like all, like here's all the boxes I check for having this insane amount of privilege and just like putting it out there. Um, I think it's important for them to be able to acknowledge those, those pieces of their identity, uh, especially just given our, our demographic, you know, with, with, with well, at least here where, where I teach. Um, and I think, you know, it's providing the space for these conversations to come up organically too is really important. Um, anytime you have control over what you can do with your curriculum, I know like Meg, I think we're in a similar boat where we can, especially in humanities, like we don't really have a specific program we have to follow. So we can really, really take time and, and looking through things through the equity lens and social justice and saying, all right, well, all right, well let's look at these different sides. Let's look through, um, you know, different experiences that people have. And I think that's really important too, of trying not to follow just like, all right, here's like a one track, you know, way of thinking. Um, and just find those moments in your day when you do have control over what kind of things that you have within your programming. Um, and it's, it's you know, I, I go back to, I'm very fortunate to be teaching a graduate level course at St. Mike's and another one at Champlain. And we've been using for one of those courses, uh, Alex Bennett's text, Equity Center, Trauma Informed Education, which again, if people haven't read that, I would really, really encourage them to read it. And she just has, I pull up this one, one so simple like sentence, I think is like a crux of a lot of her work. She just says, if we want schools to be trauma informed, we need to fight for equity because lack of equity causes trauma. And just like looking at that lens of, you know, both the, are the, the relationship between equity and trauma and, and understanding that trauma doesn't stop at the door for these students that are coming into school, but schools can traumatize students. And a lot of that is from lack of doing some of this equity work. So I, there's just so much work to be done. And, and again, I, I just see myself as a lifelong learner, like always trying to take up any opportunities I can for workshops, learning more about this, reading. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I, I appreciate my students when they're talking about stuff. And I think they appreciate when I'm just acknowledging that, yeah, I'm on this journey with them too, of learning more and just becoming a better person and more inclusive as we go. Awesome. So, um, I, so right away, I'm, I'm, I'm always using the norms of courageous conversations by, you know, Glenn Singleton and really particularly with a predominantly white class, like getting them comfortable with discomfort and building their, just their, their, um, their stamina for tackling difficult conversations. A lot of them have developed avoidance, um, you know, different, different ways to avoid these kind of conversations. And so we've got to get them used to grappling with hard histories and hard truths and uh, of our country. Um, so, so for me, those norms are really helpful. And then I'm leaning on the work of, of Rebecca Haslam and also Chad Bird and Grattan, um, where they have the, the calling in, calling out strategies, like really clear. I just use them um, with undergraduates. And then I used to use a fifth grade version that, um, that Chad Bird and Grattan developed. And what I think it is, is like, it's like any skill you need to have the practice. You need to think about what are the words and what are the moves. So like you see something that's happening that's racist, that's biased, that's whatever it is, you need to interrupt it, right? These are, you need to question, you know, what did you mean when you said that? And then you might need to educate. Did you know that that was felt really harmful to me for this reason? And then, um, you know, um, echoing back like that, you know, that, that I believe we can change this or whatever it is that you that you want to move forward with. But if you're giving kids like, like anything we want them to remember, we're going to give them steps, right? And then we're going to give them practice. And so this is just like that. And um, and it's building their, their endurance um, and their abilities to be able to handle those things. And of course, the earlier question that you brought up, Don, if you have these strong relationships in the community, then you're going to be way more able to, to do these things. Um, so it's really all tied together. And I do lean heavily on um, like, the see the way work and the learning for justice work. And then you've got those students where harm has already been done. Um, I've had some recent experiences with that. And, um, and you've got to see it and acknowledge it and make it valid. And it's hard, right? Like, like it's, it's something that a school has done. If there's been a school caused trauma, like, like uh, one of our big jobs, I think is to listen to that and believe that, and then make a plan to try to to come around to something different, something that's healing. Um, yeah, it's some of the biggest work I think we do, you know? Yeah. 
so one of the themes I think I'm hearing uh, is that this idea of continuing to learn. A lot of times I show up to these conversations and I end up feeling like a beginner. And uh, right now I'm feeling a little bit like a beginner. Um, one of the things also I appreciate about what Katie just said that ties back to the beginning of our conversation was this idea of student skills. So a lot of us are focused on these skills of, uh, you know, presenting and communicating and reading and writing and uh, turning and talking, just the kind of basic moves for a middle level teacher. But then the, the next level up is the skills for disrupting bias or, or the skills for recognizing um, exclusion and discriminatory behavior and helping kids develop the skills, as Katie mentioned, the moves uh, for doing that. And I think those are super important. Um, but I also feel like, I have to be honest, I feel like uh, a couple of years ago, there was a really strong movement, you know, the anti-racism movement, especially around uh, George Floyd and, and that happening. And it was, people were talking a lot more about it. And then kind of that was in the middle of the pandemic. And I feel like I haven't heard as much about it or I haven't seen as much movement on that lately because people seem to be, okay, we're back in school, we're trying to get back to normal and we're not maybe focused on these issues as clearly as we were before. And so that's something that makes me nervous because I worked with a, a, a person, a parent actually, who said to me one time, they said, you know, if you're not talking about these issues in these situations um, with the kids, they might not be saying anything, but they're thinking about them. And they're also probably talking with each other about them. And so if they're talking with each other about these, these very big issues about, you know, gender equality, about race, about discrimination, and you're not talking about them, then you become further and further removed from their reality. And that's absolutely not what, what we want, right? And so just thinking about that, um, I think about that you know, a lot and how if, a, if the kids last week were having this conversation about racism, how am I following up on that? What am I doing about that to address that? So they see that not only am I an ally, but they have a space where they can be talking about it and hearing about it and learning about it. And so that's something that, um, I'm thinking about a lot. The other thing that we're thinking uh, about in my classroom is these three spheres of sustainability, the environment, the economics, and the equity or the social piece. So one big question is who has access to these opportunities, right? And does everybody have access? And if they don't, why don't they? And what are the barriers to that? And so that's been really helpful for me. And again, I need to do a much better job of framing our conversations in that way. Like you can't have a sustainable community if people don't, if people aren't treated equally or they don't have access to the opportunities or they don't have access to the resources. So why has that been happening and what can we do to change that? And then another, just, I don't know if this is a quote unquote move, but another thing that I do is that with the UN SDGs, uh, they have a book club and I teach a lot, not a lot, but I use picture books a lot and picture books, for all grade levels, I think can be a great way of illustrating what's happening metaphorically and literally. And I think about Jacqueline Woodson and each kindness or the day we begin. I think uh, Matt De La Pena has a book, uh, Market Street. Oh yeah, there it is right there. Uh, last stop on Market Street. And there's actually a, a, a big variety of books that you can pull into the classroom that show different characters. I think someone was mentioning how if kids see themselves in the text that you're presenting, that can help them connect to your community. So um, using those types of texts, I think can be pretty effective. And it's also a great, an easy way maybe to get into some really interesting conversations um, without having, you know, kids don't need to have, you know, these, uh, really highly developed literacy skills to say, hey, what's happening with this character and why are they being treated like that? And can I connect that to something that's happening in my life? Um, I just wanna thank everybody. We're kind of at the end of our time here. And I feel like that conversation that we just had is one that's also gonna be threaded through much of what we're doing uh, this year and the conversations we're, we're having. Um, 
thank you everybody so much. Uh, we talk about this every, this is our eighth season. I can't believe it. Um, but I just deeply appreciate everybody's insight. And um, does anybody have any last thoughts or words before we sign off? I do have a few events that I'd like to remind people of, but before we, we go, does anybody have any last ideas or thoughts? I actually, um, Don, you made me think like silence is a curriculum. Avoidance is a curriculum. You know, these are concepts like, like it, it just really, it's, it's, you made me think of that, that like, it, you, like you're teaching kids to be silent about these things if you're just not talking about them. But so you just made me think of that. I don't want to end on that as much as, and appreciate joining you all, but um, it really just stood out to me based on what you said. That could be your next book title. <laughs> um, Don, I was just going to add like, you know, for, for teachers, for folks that are out there, it doesn't, you don't have to be a new teacher, but sometimes um, just connecting with other teachers in some way, um, I think just helps us to, if you're not part of a team, it's, I think it's wrong to assume that all teachers necessarily have a team that they work with. And so even if it's just getting out and uh, talking to somebody, going for a walk, meeting up with them, bouncing off ideas, sharing resources. Um, I just think that helps to like uh, foster a sense that they're not, you know, that we're not alone in this work. There's others out there to help us. All right, folks, uh, just a couple things to put on your radar. Um, the Race Up for Learning continues to have uh, racial justice dialogues that happen every month. Uh, you can access those and sign up for them on the Up for Learning's website. Also, uh, Up for Learning is hosting the Cultivating Pathways to Sustainability. That first retreat is October 13th, I believe, at Shelburne Farms. And then our next conversation is going to be on October 20th. And currently the topic of that is gonna be supporting peers, colleagues, and new teachers. And I expect that some of the uh, issues we talked about uh, tonight and also what Meg just said, you know, connecting and supporting those folks, uh, we'll talk more in, in depth about them. Uh, I just, again, the Middle Grades Collaborative, I wanna thank them for their work uh, in support of this. I wanna thank all of you for your deep commitment to education. It's so good to see and hear you. Katie, thank you for joining us. Uh, great points as always. And I hope that you get to go outside today. The sun is shining a little bit right now. So go outside, enjoy it. And uh, we will see you next month. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. And thanks for all your work. Take care. Bye now. Bye.